Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. I hope you received a blessing already this morning. I really have felt God's Spirit moving in our time of worship this morning, and I'm grateful. I can hardly wait to stand up here this morning to share with you. Mark chapter 1, third message in this series from the Gospel according to Mark, and today we read a story about real people and about how Jesus changed their lives. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the Gospel of God and saying, This time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him, and going on a little farther, He saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. Notice, Jesus didn't say, come follow the rules. He said, come follow me. The Christian life isn't a bunch of rules and regulations and rituals. Is simply following Jesus. Salvation isn't a creed embracing beliefs. Salvation even, even isn't a baptism in a creek. Salvation is in Christ. And when we follow Jesus, when we really follow Him, then we want to do what He does. And as we know from Scripture, Jesus didn't come primarily to heal, though He did. But He didn't come to just to heal, or if that had been His focus, He would have probably established a hospital someplace. He didn't come just to teach. If He had done that, then He had probably started a school someplace. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. And when we follow Him... That will be our passion as well. So when we talk about fishing for men, we're talking about bringing people to Jesus. We see in our text here that Jesus called Peter, Andrew, James, and John to be fishers of men. Do you know why? They were already fishermen. They knew how to catch fish. Now, when Jesus called Matthew, the tax collector... He didn't tell him to fish for men, but Matthew went fishing anyway, and he would uh, host a dinner so all of his tax collector friends could meet Jesus. And as we study how Jesus worked with his followers and his disciples, he talked about fishing for people to these four fishermen. And I think there are several fishing tips that we can apply from our text today in whatever field we're working in, whether you're in ministry, whether you're retired, whether you have a job in some other place, whatever, or your recreation time, you can apply these tips to fishing for people, bringing people to Jesus. One thing that's important if you could be a good fisherman is to know where the fish are located. Now, there are a lot of uh, potholes around Tucson, in case you haven't noticed. And after a big rain, those potholes are filled with water. Now, these potholes may be big, and they may may be deep, and they may have water in them, but that's the wrong place to fish because there's not any fish there. You'll never catch fish until you're willing to leave your house and to go where the fish are. So that means to us as a church, we can't go fishing unless we go out to to find where the fish are. We're going out to where they are. People without Christ aren't knocking down our doors to be here on Sunday mornings. We have to go after them because, well, one reason, the Great Commission starts with what word? Okay, say it with me. Go. 
That's how we will find the people. Over in Luke chapter 14, uh, Jesus compared the kingdom of God to a man who threw a party. Oh, they had sent all, out all kinds of invitations to the VIPs of that community. And, uh, but all of these people who were invited to this big party came up with phony excuses why they couldn't come. So Jesus said in Luke 14, verse 23, Go out to the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be full. God wants His house to be full. Now oftentimes we're talking about, well, that must be about the church house. God wants the household of faith to be full. That's what He's asking. That's what He's wanting from us. And there are thousands of people who are not yet in the family of God, and God wants us to go after them and tell them that God loves them. Max Lucado, one of my favorite writers, wrote these words. Jesus wasn't crucified in a church building over a baptistry between an organ and a piano in front of a bunch of coats and ties, like me. He was crucified on a cruel cross between two hardened criminals. He wasn't crucified in a nice neighborhood but at a crossroads of the world so cosmopolitan that the crime that he had committed had to be written in three languages. He died at the kind of place where thieves are cursed and soldiers gambled. And that's where we need to take the gospel. Good fishermen understand how fish behave. I love the old episodes of the Andy Griffith Show. Uh, I think it's maybe the first episode, one of the very first ones, is about fishing. Opie was a little boy. Aunt B was coming to Mayberry and uh, really kind of coming on a trial basis. She was she was going to come to take care of Andy and Opie. And she was trying desperately to fit in so that Opie would like her. She agreed one day to go fishing with Andy and Opie. She didn't know much about fishing. Because if you remember, she was holding her bait a few feet above the water. Now little Opie knew that wasn't the way to fish. And so... He started complaining about that and griping about it. So Andy was very quick to answer that that really that saved Aunt B some embarrassment. He explained to Opie that Aunt B was such a good fisherman, she was trying to catch the flying fish. (laughs) Now that satisfied Opie, but it was pretty clear that Aunt B didn't understand how how fish act. And if we're going to reach people for Christ, we must understand the world. We need to study the culture without buying into it. Matter of fact, you don't have to become a fish to understand how a fish acts. You don't have to become a lost person to understand them either. But what this means is we should intentionally make friends with people who don't know Christ. Now, here's the sad truth for me. And I think it's a sad truth for many of you as well, too. In my various roles as a pastor, as a director of missions, and a North American Mission Board missionary, I don't hang around with a lot of lost people. Most of my friends or colleagues who are in the ministry, who are involved in uh, church life in a strong way, and that's that's only natural. We want to hang out with other Christians. We want to hang out with people who have our values and who, we, who like us and we like them. But Jesus was a friend of sinners. He spent time eating and fellowshipping with the worst of the worst. Matter of fact, he was criticized because he ate with the sinners. He responded that only sick people need a doctor, 
And the problem, the Jewish leaders were so sick that they wouldn't even admit it. He faced that kind of criticism. Luke chapter 16, Jesus told one of his strangest parables. He talks about a dishonest accountant who cooked the books for his boss. He was going to get fired. Before he lost his job, he approached the customers of his master and gave them deep discounts on what they owed his boss. And he was hoping that maybe after he got fired, after he got sacked, they would repay his gesture. Now, his boss heard about what he had done, and here's the strange part of it. His boss complimented him on being so shrewd and let him keep his job. Now, Jesus summarized this parable by saying it this way in verse 8 of Luke 16. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light." Notice two categories Jesus placed people in. Sons of this world, sons of light. The people of this world are those who don't know Jesus. They have bought into the values and the culture of this world. Matter of fact, that's about the only thing that they have. But we, as believers, are people of the light. We have been shown a different way. Now, when we think about this, we must never forget Jesus wasn't really talking about catching fish. He was talking about capturing people who are lost and bringing them into a saving relationship with Him. In our time, it's becoming very politically incorrect to talk about unbelievers dying and going to hell. But Jesus Himself said this, I came to seek and to save those who are lost. I appreciated what Bob said so much uh, a few minutes ago about the Gideons and the distribution of the Bible. The purpose is, is to bring people into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. That's one, one avenue of doing that. There are other ways that we can do it. And that leads us to the third point. A good fisherman will have a variety of strategies. You can use different ways to catch fish. You can use a net from a boat. You can use a cast net. We're down in my neck of the woods in Louisiana. People run trot lines. You know what a trot line is? All right. Or rod and reels. When it comes to reaching people for Christ, we'll use different methods that will make a difference. You know, for more than 60 years, Billy Graham preached to huge crusades all around the world. He shared the gospel face-to-face with more people than any other person in history. He once spoke to a million people in a crusade in India. Now, when it comes to fishing for people, Dr. Graham used a huge net, like one of these commercial fishing trawlers that cast these huge nets out and catch thousands of fish. And as we take a look at that, most of us may become intimidated by that and say, well, you know what? I'm no Billy Graham. And that's true. But you know, I can remember the first time I went fishing. You know what I I used? I used an old cane pole with a fishing line and a cork and a hook with a worm on it. And I caught fish. We can use different strategies. Different people need different approaches. And the same strategy won't work for everyone. That's what Paul was writing about over in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22, when he says, To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. He used one approach while talking to the Jews, used another approach while talking to the Gentiles. When he spoke to the wise philosophers in Athens, Greece, he used an intellectual argument, even quoted one of their own poets. Here's the, here's the main thing we need to take from this, folks. Use whatever works best for you. If it's sitting in a, at Jerry Bob's and having a cup of coffee with a lost friend, 
Share the gospel then. If it's out on the golf course, whacking a few golf balls, share the gospel with the lost people that are with you. If it's standing in line in Walmart, share the gospel with people. Wherever we are and whatever context we find ourselves in, look for ways to start spiritual conversation. Find the way that works best for you. But like Jesus would say to those that he called from the lake that day, he, said, he would say to us, let's go fishing. Let's go fishing today. And a good fisherman, when they go fishing, they expect to catch fish. Uh, I, some of you may remember the old Mississippi comedian Jerry Clower. Remember Jerry? He told a story about Claude Ledbetter in Mississippi. And he was catching a boatload of fish when no one else could catch fish. So the game warden came up to Claude and says, Claude, I want to go fishing with you so I can uh, see where you're catching the fish and see how you're catching all these fish. So Claude took him out in the lake in the middle of the boat, found that place he was going to go fishing, reached under the seat, took out a stick of dynamite, lit it, threw it in the water, kaboom! And a few seconds later, a bunch of dead fish floated to the surface. The fish warden was aghast. He says, Claude, you can't do, you can't fish like this. I'm going to have to place you under arrest. Claude reached down under his seat, took out another stick of dynamite, lit it, handed it to the game warden. He says, you going to fish or are you going to talk? Good fishermen always expect to catch fish, even if they don't. That's why they call it going fishing instead of going catching. There's a measure of faith involved because you usually can't see the fish. You kind of suspect they're there. You, you're hoping that you'll be able, they'll, be able, they'll take the hook. But it takes real faith to share your faith with others as well. Not, you're not putting your faith in yourself or your skill. You're putting your faith in the, person, in the person who needs Jesus and putting your faith in Jesus who will make a difference in that person's life. You have to believe Jesus can and will help the person. Over in Matthew chapter 9, verses 28 and 29, Jesus tells this story about two blind men they came to him for help. He said over in verse 28, When he entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it done to you. Now, if they hadn't believed that Jesus could heal them, they wouldn't have experienced sight. But their faith was rewarded with the power of Jesus. In order to be an effective witness, you have to have absolute confidence that Jesus can make a difference in the lives of the people you know. If you don't expect people to, ex to accept Christ, chances are they won't. Go believing in the power of Jesus and with confidence share how He has changed your life and the difference He makes. And lastly this morning, good fishermen are patient even if they don't catch fish immediately. You know, good fishermen, if they don't catch fish after the first 20 or 30 casts, they don't load up and go home. That's why I'm not a good fisherman. I don't catch anything quick. I'm out of here. They'll move on to another spot or try a different bait. But they're going to keep on fishing. And sometimes we as believers have a hard time because we don't seem to have a great deal of success landing fish. We'll say, well, we've tried, we've shared our stories, we, we've shared the gospel. 
It doesn't seem to work. They hear stories of, of hundreds of people, of people who have led hundreds of people to Christ, and they feel intimidated. Some of you may be thinking this morning, John, I would even have t- a hard time starting a spiritual conversation with another person. Jesus says, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. The longer you follow Jesus, the more closely you follow him, the more he will make you into a fisher of men. Listen to what James said over in James 5, 7 and 8. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. See, when you're fishing for people, patience isn't a virtue, it's a necessity. A person without Jesus may often resist and even resent your attempt to share Christ with them. And that's okay. You keep loving them. You keep showing them God's love. You keep praying for them. George Mueller was a great preacher in the 1800s. He ran an orphanage that cared for over 100,000 children. He established over 100 schools over in the United Kingdom. He was a great man of faith. And in his journal, Mueller recorded that one day he started praying for five of his friends to come to Christ. After many months, one of them came to the Lord. Ten years later, two more were converted. It took 25 years before the fourth man was saved. But he persevered in prayer until his death for the fifth friend And throughout those 52 years, he never gave up hoping he would accept Christ. Mueller died at the age of 78, and his faith was rewarded. For soon after Mueller's funeral, that last man gave his heart to Christ. Fifty-two years he prayed. If we're going to be fishers of men, we must be patient people. It's not a microwave experience. It takes time to cultivate, to nurture. And oftentimes it takes time to break down the barriers that are there. Let me ask you this as as we close this morning. Have you ever initiated a spiritual conversation with a person? really kind of using our analogy of the day, if you don't ever go fishing, for sure, you'll never catch fish. And you know, one day when we stand before God, He won't ask us how many fish you've caught. He's more interested in how many times we went fishing. How many times did we try? How many times did we initiate those conversations? You see, He judges us on our obedience. And our job is to share the gospel, whether anyone accepts Christ or not. Because you know what? The results are up to God. They're not up to us. There was a sign in front of a church that said, Fishers of men, you catch them, Jesus will clean them. The late Paul Harvey, radio commentator, once said, Too many Christians are no longer fishers of men, but keepers of the aquarium. Pastor in Tyler, Texas, David Dykes, wrote this short parable titled The Fishing Society. Once there was a group of people called the Fishing Society. They gathered every week to talk about the importance of fishing, but they never fished. They decided to build a new big aquarium, so they pooled their money, no pun intended, and built a sparkling new meeting hall they named 
the aquarium center. They hired an expert who had a doctor of fishology to teach them from the fishing manual. Each week they gathered in their beautiful building and read portions of the fishing manual. And the meetings ended with the expert dramatically casting a net into the large tank into the center of the aquarium center. The members rushed to the edge and were hopeful some fish would be caught. None were ever caught, of course, because there was no fish in the tank. And this led to a disagreement among the members of the fishing society. Why weren't there fish in their beautiful aquarium? Some said, well, specialization was the answer, so they built smaller tanks specially designed for fish of all ages and sizes. But still, there were no fish. They bought the newest and most modern fishing equipment on the market. They selected numerous committees to operate the fishing society more efficiently. One group regulated the water in the aquarium. The others worked to keep the glass walls polished. Others sorted and arranged the expensive fishing gear. And finally, the fishing society decided to send a few brave members to live near the lakes and the oceans. And they called them fishinaries. And these foreign missionaries emailed pictures of themselves standing by the water holding their catches of fish. Over the years, some members of the fishing society forgot about fishing altogether. After all, there was plenty of them to keep, keep them occupied in the aquarium. Some even suggested they change their name from the fishing society to just the society. And one day a bearded stranger appeared at their aquarium. This long-haired sandal man claimed to be the master fisherman. He extended his hands to ask the members to follow him out, and he would teach them how to catch the fish with him. They noticed the man had ugly scars in his palms, probably from fishing. Nobody moved. As he turned to leave, he says, If you never go fishing, you have no right to call yourself a fisherman. I'm going fishing. And if you aren't fishing well, well, you aren't following me. After their initial shock, the members of the fishing society resumed their busy activity of maintaining their beautiful hall. They were glad their beautiful hall had not been built in vain. If nothing else, it made them feel good about themselves. Let's pray. Father, forgive me for being so busy with religious and church people that I have failed to make enough friends who are without Christ that I can share that with them. And I don't think I'm the only one in this room that would confess that this morning. And Father, help us as a church that we will always be one who's ready to follow you and not just a society. That Father, we would care more about people who are dying and going to hell than we do anything else. For we know, Father, without Jesus, that's the destiny. Maybe this morning we're even casting a net into this room. And Father, I pray that if there's someone here today without you, that today they will be caught for Jesus. And Father, give us 
courage to initiate conversations that can lead to people's lives being changed forever. Help us, Father, to overcome our reluctance. Forgive us for our impatience. Strengthen us when we are weak and afraid. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. What's God said to you this morning? He's spoken to me about some things that I need to do something different in my life because I know too many of the good guys. If you're like that as well too, I pray that God is saying something into your life today that would want to bring that change about as well. And help us be ready to just start a spiritual conversation wherever we are, however we can. That will make a difference. Maybe planting a seed, maybe catching that fish that day for the kingdom's sake. We're going to stand in just a moment here. We're going to sing a, a song of commitment, a song of invitation. The invitation, the song is really geared towards those without Christ. We want you to come today and trust Him and believe in Him and, and begin that new walk with Him today. Would you do that? I'll be at the front. There'll be some deacons here. There'll be others who can help you. Would you come this morning and just say, yes, I'm giving my life to Christ today. Maybe you're here this morning as a Christ follower. And you say, you know, I just need to rededicate, recommit my life to being a fisherman. Because if I was asked today if I was a fisherman for Jesus, I couldn't answer that very, very strongly. Maybe the morning you want to do that. Or maybe today, this is the day you're looking to become part of a church family. We would welcome you and encourage you to think about what that means. Stand with us, Ron. What number are we going to sing? Hymn number 504. As we sing, we invite you to come today.